Good day, everybody. Praise God. It's good to be back with you, Erlanda Gardner here. And today we want to start a series on prayers of men and women of God in the Bible. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord God, for another time, another opportunity to share your word with your people. Lord, we know the enemy is always working behind the scenes to disrupt Lord Jesus Christ's message. And so we rebuke the enemy now in the name of Jesus Christ. And that, Lord God, the word will go forth with clarity. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, we're going to start off by looking at Jacob. Right? What can we learn from Jacob as, um, as he prayed when he was in a serious situation? Right? So, we have, there are lessons to be learned. We want to learn them. In this study, we'll explore some characters from the Bible who prayed when they were in trouble and God delivered. In some of the instances, we're going to learn valuable lessons, praise God, as to the approach that they took with their struggle that will help us when we're in some similar struggles and also what not to do in those situations. All right? So we're going to start off with Jacob. And um, you can write this down. We're going to be looking at Genesis 32, 9 to 12. Also, it's good to read all of Genesis 31. we key verses there, 3 to 7 and 38 to 41. All right, so first up is Genesis 32, verse 9 to 12. That documents the prayer of Jacob as he prayed because, you know, he heard that his brother Esau, um, who he has not seen for about 20 years, is on his way to see him. All right, and um, he remembered um, why they separated in the first place. He had to um, be carted off because his, his brother was consoling himself with the thought of killing him because of what he did yeah, and um, you know at first he had taken his birthright but then to add insult to injury later while his father was ailing he took the premium blessing the firstborn blessing and um, indeed it was very grievous to him and um, so here we are Jacob thinking that look he's going to exact his revenge against me and my family no my, my children my my servants, everything. It was just a big mess in his mind. And so he earnestly sought the Lord. It says, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I'll make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I'll surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. All right, so that's the prayer, right? Uh, let's, let's look at um, the first line, you know. Let's look at the first line. It says, um, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac. You know, it's an interesting line, I think. You know, why he start to pray off like that? Oh, the God of my father Abraham and my father Isaac. Which, in fact, is, you know, his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. But, you know, the fathers of the faith, Right? Why he started off his prayer like that? It was very interesting. Maybe it's because, um, you know, he wanted not to make any mistake on who he's calling on here. Because, look, there are a lot of false gods um, in those times. And a lot of idol worship, you know, existed in those times. It was very prevalent. prevalent. Even his wife, wife's father, uh, worship, worship um, false gods. They had false deities there. Rachel herself, when they fled Haran from Laban, she took away his idols. Right, the Bible didn't tell us why she did that, but you know it was done, you know, and um, so that was really prevalent. Right, Jacob's Jacob's great grandfather, that's Terah, he he made the idols, so there was this culture of idolatry that was going on. So perhaps, you know, um, Jacob was saying, "Look here, man, no time for make no mistake. Who may I call upon right now? You know, I'm calling on the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac." Well said. But I think though, the primary reason for um, Jacob's listing of his earthly fathers in the prayer lies in the fact that the promise, that massive promise given to Abraham, 
no rest on him. Because here it is. Abraham, you're going to have descendants as numerous as the sand on the sea. You know, Abraham didn't see all of that come into reality. So it passed on to Isaac. Isaac didn't see that become a reality. Now it's resting on Jacob. So Jacob is saying, hey, Father, look here. Father Almighty God, that's it. You know, if me dead, this this thing is not going to come to pass, you know. So please see the continuity here. It's, it's Abraham, Isaac, and no me, Jacob. So <laughs> I believe that he's just trying to let God realize that, hey, there is a continuum going on here, so I can't die. I need your help. Okay. So that's what I believe there was a reason for that. Uh, moving on to the next line. Um, next line is in Genesis 32, verse 9, part B. It says, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I'll make you prosper. You can find that instruction in Genesis 31, and I think verse 3. Right, the Lord tell him, get up and go. Right, Jacob was actually discerning and noticing that the attitude of Laban towards him had changed, right? And then subsequent to God, subsequent to that, God actually spoke to him and said, "Look here, boss, get up and go back to your your father, the land, right?" So, you know, Jacob was actually saying, <laughs> "Remember, you know, father, you were the one that told me to get up and leave, you know. So all I'm doing is just following your instructions, and by acting on your instructions, no, I'm in trouble, you know. So I'm, you have got delivered me." So he just put in that line to, to remind the lad, as, you know, so, so that I can realize that, look, I was just trying to be an obedient child. So I think we need to take note right here that um, there, there are times when we feel that because we've done all that we are supposed to do, that we should be free of all trouble and all of that. But that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. Actually, by design, sometimes God pushes you into trouble, right? to bring forth his end, you know, so that he can be glorified. Right? Look at the man that was born blind in the Gospels, right? I think Genesis, it, uh, sorry, um, John, St. John chapter 9, somewhere there. You know, um, what a thing, eh? So here are the, the, the Pharisees, them know, so who sinned? The Lord says, neither, right? Because you say, who sinned? Is it his father or, or did he sin? How can the man sin and the man was born that way? But, you know, it's just so sad. Right? And the Lord says, neither, neither did he sin nor his parents, but that the Lord may be glorified. So the Lord will do things, uh, put us through situations so that he will be glorified and that his will will be accomplished. So the Lord, Lord's um, intention for us when he passes us through many waters is for us to be tested, to be tried, to be strengthened, to be, you know, purified. Um, and I made better and, made, and, and to become holy, right? Holiness must never leave us, friends. You know, a lot of times we, we, we're not hearing about holiness as much as we should. But holiness is an important, important concept in the Word of God. In the book of 1 Peter, I think 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 3, it says, Without holiness, no man shall see God, right? Amen. So let's, let's continue. Or First Peter chapter um, three verse one. Sorry about that. Following God's instruction does not mean we'll be trouble free. All right. Many are the afflictions. Psalm thirty-four verse nineteen says, "Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivereth him out of them all." all right. Let's continue. Um, Genesis thirty-two verse ten. It says, "I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant." I had all my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Amazing. He is just showing humility, you know, total submission to Almighty God, and actually showing his gratitude to the Lord and declaring that all that he has is as a result of the blessing of Almighty God. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Right? Jacob continues to pray. And in verse 11, finally, he says, Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. Right? The request just coming in, you know. 
So all of the things that were said before was just to get to this point. He was setting up the prayer to get to this point for the request. Right? So he honored the Lord. He talked about God's goodness. He reminded God about his promises and everything. And that I'm just being an obedient child. Everything. He, he, he did all of that just to get to this point. No, Lord, save me. You know? So it's really a quite interesting approach by Jacob. You know, and I do trust and pray that we will, you know, have learned some lessons out of this um, and be able to apply it to a scenario that is going on in our life. Or, you know, in times to come, we'll remember that, look, we can approach things in this way as well. The last part of the, just to say the last part of the prayer, Genesis 32 verse 30 says, But you have said, I will surely make you prosper. I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. A massive promise from God. He will come through. He will deliver. Right? The key lesson here is that praying back, the word of God is very critical. God honors his word about his very name. Right? We stand on sure ground once we stand on the word of God. So if in doubt what to say, what to pray to God, let's pray back his words to him. Right? His promises are yea and amen. They are true. His words are tried seven times in fire. Right? They are perfected. God's words can be trusted. God can be trusted. And so you're not doing anything wrong when you stand on the word. As a matter of fact, when you stand on the word of God, it releases his will. And Lord, yes, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. God bless you.